Hello everyone, welcome back. We got another uh, video here for Philosophy 115 Summer 2019. Um, and we're about to start um, the second big module that's uh, feeding into Exam 2. So with Exam 1 we had like three modules. Uh, with Exam 2 it's like two big ones. One was the formal logic stuff which we wrapped up in the last video. And, and then this one, we're now getting into inductive reasoning. So formal logic is all about deduction. It's all about validity uh, as the standard for the support relations for arguments. And here uh, in the chapters 8, 9, and 10, kind of all glommed together, we're tackling inductive reasoning, which is about the standard of strength as a way to evaluate the arg an argument's support relation, for whether it has a good support relation or not. Um, a couple uh, comments here before I, I start diving right into it. Um, the uh, I've been promising a video on um, going over some logic problems. So the the lectures I gave on the chapter six material in formal logic covered everything. Like the Tuesday lecture got to the end of everything intellectually uh, you need to know or theoretically in order to um, understand the material. There's nothing more conceptually that really needs to be talked about. But, as you know in this class, uh, the intellectual understanding is half the battle. The other half of the battle is learning how to be competent in applying those concepts and theoretical principles in actual cases of analysis. And I think there's um, a lot more that we can do there. I can give you some help with learning formal logic through uh, seeing it demonstrated more. So. I am still planning on recording a video. I might be able to get to it this afternoon. It's possible, or maybe late tonight. I might do that, um, or tomorrow. Uh, but definitely, definitely tomorrow it'll get done if it doesn't get done today. Um, I have a little window of opportunity, but my one-on-one students have a paper due tomorrow, and I have a feeling I will be talking on the phone with a bunch of them, and that might zap all my time. But I'm planning on doing some demonstrations for you. So even though I'm, I'm moving on to new material in this video, there's going to be another one coming down really soon to help uh, kind of tie off to Chapter 6 material with the bow. Um, also, uh, in terms of current affairs, um, Exam 1, um, you, uh, you need to have that completed soon. And I will be, uh, as soon as the deadline is up, I will start grading all of them and try to turn those around ASAP. Uh, and the reason I want to do this as soon as possible for you is that once it's graded, then we can, uh, you can review it. Uh, I, I actually have a video already recorded, ready to go, where I walk through all of the uh, answers to exam one, and I will post that as soon as the as soon as the exam closes down and everyone's taken it. Um, <clears throat> of course, uh, not until everyone's taking it will I give you the answers. Um, and you can review that and take a look at your answers and you'll see, uh, once I have your, your exam graded, you'll see where you got partial credit um, and all that breakdown. And you can start considering the makeup exam for exam one, which I will also make available uh, as soon as the exam is graded. Um, I, I'm not going to I, I really actually strongly encourage students usually to make sure you talk with me before taking the makeup exam. And the reason it co just comes from past experience. Um, students that don't talk to me and just retake the exam uh, generally get almost exactly the same scores. It's kind of spooky. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going through it and grading their answers on the makeup and I'm not thinking of what their exam looked like the first time. You know, I'm. I don't have them side by side or anything. I'm just grading them straight again. And usually it turns out that it's like the exact same scores. Whereas the students that we talk about it, we do some debriefing about it, um, trying to diagnose like what went wrong, what kind of adjustments, recalibrations we could make. Those students end up doing a lot better uh, generally. Um, in fact, I've many times seen the makeups uh, have a student going from a failing grade to an A or a B. Uh, it's definitely happened many times. So if something does go wrong on exam one, there is going to be an opportunity to kind of take another stab at it um, and and learn from it. I, I really like using exams not just as a evaluative mechanism in my classes, but uh, when I do use them at all. 
but as something that can be a part of the learning process. So I encourage you to do that with them uh, and reach out to me as always to uh, make that happen. Um, and, uh, and then <clears throat> exam two will be happening next week after we get done with this unit. I'm hoping that in two maybe longer video sessions today and Tuesday, we'll be able to get through all of the, uh, the chapter eight, nine, 10 material. We'll see how that goes. I might be wrong in that. Uh, and if I'm, uh, we'll see how far we get today. If today we don't get as far as I think we need to get in order to finish everything on Tuesday, then I will probably record another supplementary lecture this weekend um, in order to kind of keep things moving along. Because I want you to have access to exam two as early as possible so that you'll be able to potentially do a makeup for exam two before the quarter all shuts down. Um, and we've we're, we've only got a couple more weeks here, so uh, time is is starting to run out on us for summer quarter. I mean, it doesn't. I guess it's uh, it's weird. It's mysterious during summer because every week is kind of like two weeks or a week and a half or something. So um, we're on pace. We're okay, I think. Um, and another thing I, I wanted to mention to everybody, I've mentioned this to a couple of you. So the quarter. Uh, the last day of classes is supposed to be August, Thursday, August 15th. Um, and I need to have grades due to Bellevue College. I need to submit your grades to them um, by the 19th, so the following Monday. What I can do, I mean, I'm pretty used to end of term gradings, grading just being a nightmare marathon anyway. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up all of the end of term stuff all the way till the 18th. So if you can get everything, if you can get stuff done by midnight on the 18th, I am guaranteeing I will get it graded and and all squared away by the end of Monday. Um, so uh, in in the deadline the school gives me to submit grades. So I want to open up that last weekend even after the last day of classes so that you've got some more flexibility because uh, I know your schedule, a lot of you have, have difficult schedules you're working with balancing. I wanted to just give you as much opportunity as possible. So if you want to anticipate what's going to be happening here at the end of the term, let's do a little run through of it. That's kind of what I'm already doing. I think it'd be helpful to keep the, uh, the end in mind here about like what we've got uh, happening over the next couple weeks as, as the term finishes up. So um, I want to have by the 6th, by August 6th, that's Tuesday, I want to have all the stuff for exam two, all the material done. Then I can open up exam two and you can be working on exam two through um, my plan is here Monday the 12th. That's what I'm thinking right now. Um, so that's not quite a week, but pretty close. You'll have that whole weekend to do exam two, um, and you could do it earlier if you wanted to. It also gives you a few days to like study and prepare, contact me if you want to check in on things, all that good stuff. Um, and then uh, we'll, through the Thursday the 8th, Tuesday the 13th, and Thursday the 15th, we'll have that time set aside for covering the last unit of the class um, this little unit on in the informal fallacies. And I'm hoping that that's going to be enough time that we'll be able to knock out a lot of them. They're, the informal fallacies unit is like learning a lot of different little patterns of how arguments can go wrong. What, bad argumentative practice, faulty reasoning, this kind of thing. And, and so being able to pick out those patterns is the main educational objective there. And then I do have an exam three in the class. And this one will not be one that you can redo because there just isn't time for it. Um, but this last exam is not going to be as intense as exam one or exam two. It's just going to be a little matching exam where I give you snippets of a conversation or someone giving an argument, and then you have to identify like what's the fallacy, what's the improper thing that's going on in that situation. So you'll have a list of the fallacies, you'll have all these scenarios, and you just need to match them up. And that'll be it. So, and that, and during that period too, I'll, I'll hopefully after exam two is done on Monday the 12th, I'll have that turned around and graded for you. Hopefully by the 14th or just as quick as I possibly can. Um, and then you'll have 
through to the end of the term through the 18th, uh, you'll have to uh, take exam three, do a makeup for exam two, and I'll leave the makeup for exam one open the whole way through the end of the quarter as well. So uh, all those opportunities will be what you'll uh, have on your plate um, for that last stretch of the quarter. So things are uh, things move fast in summer, and uh, we got to get everything done. So that's where we're at. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a just just I think it's helpful advice or just it's useful for me to comment on this just to put it on your radar. Summer quarter you've already probably felt is a little rough just by how fast we have to go through material. Um, to have the quarter condensed in seven weeks means that any given week, like week one, week two, week three, you know, the, the core weeks of the quarter are already kind of demanding. But it really, even though we're, we're working on a kind of a similar pace here at the end of the quarter, it still just picks up because there's all of a sudden this like big deadline. So during the, the rest of the summer quarter, things are packed in, but you know, you can, if you get behind on something, you can pick it back up, you know, later. But at the end of the quarter is like this hard wall that we just like run right into. So it can feel a little bit more intense here at the end, um, just because now there's like a stopping point um, and there isn't the chance to like pick it up later or something like that. So over the next couple of weeks, I encourage you to be thinking about that, to be aware of that. Make sure you have time set aside and planned for uh, finishing these exams and uh, and preparing for them, and that uh, we can find opportunity to talk. Um, if everyone's trying to talk to me last minute, that probably won't work, <laughs> or at least some some people will get talked to and some people might not. Um, but if you're uh, anticipating this stuff and planning ahead and choosing as much as possible to try to talk to me earlier rather than last minute, then there's a much higher guarantee that we'll be able to do that. And you'll ha we'll have that opportunity and and um, and you'll get what you need. Oh, the mechanical closet's making a lot of noise. Hmm. One second. That's weird. Um, I think it's happening in the room above, but. I can't really do anything about that. I hope the buzz is not too bad. Um, you may not even be picking it up on the microphone, but I can definitely hear it. It's like wah, wah, wah. Okay. Uh, so that's a little bit of like where we are in checking in about the class. Um, let's, let's start talking about the 8, 9, 10 unit. Um, I've encouraged, uh, I mentioned this before, but I'll, I'll say it again. During this unit, uh, it's a little different game than what we did with Chapter 6. With validity, it's a one-size-fits-all sort of thing. It doesn't matter the form of the argument. The way we analyze that argument for validity and what the standard is, like where the, the bar is set, is exactly the same no matter what we're talking about. Um, in inductive reasoning, once we're evaluating the standard of strength, things get a little goofy because there are a lot of different forms of inductive reasoning. And each of the different forms of inductive reasoning comes with its own criteria for strength. Um, it has its own set of uh, principles that we use to evaluate whether the ar that an argument of that type is strong or weak. So it gets more complicated. That's why there's three chapters devoted to this, uh, 8, 9, and 10. And so it's kind of like a bunch of mini modules where it's studying this type of argument and how to evaluate it, and this type of argument and how to evaluate it, and so on and so forth. And we're going to cover five types here. Um, so that's a little goofy, uh, and it means that while there are going to be some recurring themes, each of those different arguments needs to be treated independently of the other types. Uh, you don't mix and match the standards between them. So um, what I've encouraged for how to be a student during this unit is to be, you don't need to necessarily read all three chapters of the text right now, like all at once, but you kind of want to read ahead a little bit watch the lecture, do some homework problems on those types, and then keep it going, keep that cycle going. In fact, you might even, if you're, uh, no one's in the chat today, um, but if you're watching this on YouTube later, you might study the first form. Uh, we're going to start with statistical generalizations, um, and then 
uh, stop, pause the video when I'm done talking about it, go and do some of the homework problems on that type, and then watch the lecture on the next type, statistical applications, uh, and then do the homework on that, and so on and so forth. Maybe read the text on statistical generalizations, watch my video on it, do the exercises for it. Read the text on statistical applications, watch the video on that, do the homework. Do that kind of cycle of it. I think that might, will probably serve you the best, and especially in terms of not like confusing them all with each other. Um, it might be better to study one type, get some practice on it, go to the next one, um, rather than trying to swallow the whole meal all at once. I've, I've mentioned before binge, binge working in this class doesn't work generally, um, but especially I think for this unit that, that's good advice I can give you. For how to be a student. Okay, so inductive reasoning. I've already mentioned uh, at the beginning of this video how uh, this is back to how we evaluate arguments on two criteria. Uh, good arguments are going to have all true premises, and that's the same no matter what type of argument we're talking about, but they also need to have the second condition, they have to have a good support relation. And we've talked before about how we have two standards for how we could evaluate whether the support relation is good or bad. There's deductive validity and inductive strength. The formal logic unit from Chapter 6 completely covers validity, and now in a more precise and technical way. Um, now we're talking about inductive strength. Whereas with validity, it was this kind of all or nothing black and white scenario. The argument is either valid or invalid. Those are the only two options. And the standard is pretty straightforward. It's requiring that the, pre the truth of the premises, if the premises are true, that provides a total guarantee for the truth of the conclusion. Absolute certainty. Airtight argument. No wiggle room. No leaps in logic. Um, no fallibility, really. Uh, as long as the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. It's not possible for it to be false given the truth of the premises. That was validity. Was, that's a really high standard. In fact, that's the highest standard out of frame. That is the highest possible standard we could hold an argument support relation to. Most arguments can't pass validity, including and especially everything that science does. The scientific method is not valid reasoning. It's inductive reasoning. It's not deductive. It's inductive. Um, even when it uses math, as a way to express itself, or you're thinking like physics equations, you shouldn't interpret that as pure logic, because it's not. Um, it's contingent. And those formulas only make sense if they correspond with how reality actually is. And just looking at the numbers doesn't show you that. Just looking at the math of it or the algebra of it doesn't tell you how the world is. <clears throat> those, those mathematical or algebraic expressions of physical principles or physical laws depends on the observations we've made of the world, and that's always fallible. And if you uh, know anything about the history of science, you know that this is what happens. It's going on right now. That one generation is like, oh, this is the theory that works. And now we're like, oh, nope, some new, some new information has come to light, some new experiments, some new evidence, and that theory is not uh, actually correct, and now we've got a different theory. The fact that scientific reasoning and inductive reasoning generally is open to those kinds of defeaters. Oh, if some new stuff comes to light, then now that disproves our reasoning from before shows that it's not valid. In valid arguments, it wouldn't matter what comes up, no matter the evidence, no matter how the world could possibly be, the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. It's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. But in any scientific reasoning, it's always possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. I could go on a lot of philosophical tangents about this, because there are a lot of interesting ones about the fallibility uh, of induction, some certain logical problems about it, too, uh, or epistemic problems, like Hume's problem of induction, stuff like that. I'm not going to go down all those rabbit holes right now. Again, this class is all about the kind of low-hanging fruit, the stuff that's uncontroversial. But there's plenty of stuff about inductive reasoning that is controversial, in, and philosophers debate it a lot. Um, but we're going to stick to the kind of basic stuff. We might get into some of the other 
tangential debates and controversies here as we go. Um, I think it'll be impossible for me to avoid them entirely in this curriculum, but we're not, we're not gonna be focusing on it. But if, if some of the stuff I talk about, uh, um, uh, what's your appetite for seeing or hearing more about it, I'd very much be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, and if we don't have time now during the quarter, I'd be definitely happy to talk about it with you after the quarter is over too. You can still reach out to me to talk and chat uh, even after the quarter is over. Um, you'll have my contact information. I encourage you to use it. I love talking to students. So if something comes up and you're like, yeah, I don't have time to talk to Tim about this, but I'm curious, maybe write a note about it, save it for later, and, and I'd be happy to, to talk to you about it later. Um, but so inductive strength. Um, Arguments that are inductively strong are still fallible. So even though science doesn't pass the standard of validity ever in principle, doesn't mean it's bad reasoning. Just because we can't get total certainty out of our scientific efforts, our investigative empirical efforts, doesn't mean it's bad reasoning. And that's what the whole standard of strength is for. It lowers the bar a little bit for what it takes to have a good support relation. But um, that's not something like bad. Uh, there's there's just certain matters that we can't uh, reason about using pure logic, just the pure standards of deductive validity. Uh, we need some other way to capture what's rational that doesn't fit into that kind of model. So that's where inductive strength comes in. So whatever you sort of gain by the kind of, it's nice to have the total certainty or guarantee of logical validity, but if you are only holding your knowledge-seeking efforts accountable to that standard, you wouldn't be able to know a whole lot. <laughs> you would be, you'd have, there'd be just so many topics that you wouldn't be able to touch. Um, and inductive strength allows us to talk about those subjects in a way that's still rationally accountable and still rigorous. I mean, the fact that science doesn't pass the standard of validity doesn't mean it's not rigorous. It's not critical thinking. It's very critical. Uh, and that, that's the whole goal of, of science, is to try to be as disciplined and as accountable as possible for our beliefs about the empirical world. Um, and I'm using science here a lot as an example, but it, I mean, this doesn't just apply to scientists. Uh, you're using induction on an everyday basis. Um, you are a little scientist, uh, even if you're not thinking about it that way, or you are professionally trained, or have a degree or something like that, and you're not in a research lab, uh, you're doing the same sort of thing. And I think you'll see that as we talk through these inductive arguments. A lot of them are familiar and common, um, and some of them might be a little different. There's one in particular that I think maybe you've never heard of or even thought about before, at least explicitly, but it's super common, and you're doing it every moment of every day. So that's a fun one to talk about. I, I love topics in philosophy where we're talking about something that's like right in front of our faces, um, but we we just don't see it or don't recognize everything that's going on there. Um, showing the familiar in an unfamiliar aspect is one of the coolest things about the field of philosophy. But anyway, that's a whole tangent. Yay, the buzzing stopped. This is giving me a giving me a vertigo. Um, okay, so. What, let, let's just get a rough and ready definition here for inductive strength. So if, if validity is saying, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. Strength is saying something like, if the premises are true, then that provides good reason to think the conclusion is true. Or we might say, if the premises are true, it makes it more probable that the conclusion is true. And if validity is an on-off switch, if it's all or nothing, arguments either valid or invalid, it can't be half valid. That doesn't happen based on how it's defined theoretically. With strength, we've got a spectrum. Arguments can be stronger. They could be weaker. It's kind of comparative. It's, there's a range here. There's a continuum of strength. And that's what's going to make this fuzzy and involve a lot of judgment calls. And don't ask me or any other philosopher, like, or even a scientist, like, what, uh, how do we want to quantify strength? Like, what's five strength points? Or, yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. That's pretty ambiguous. However, what's not ambiguous 
are the variables that affect an argument's strength. And that's what we're going to be learning. So in this unit, you're going to learn about like how to recognize arguments, inductive arguments of certain types, how to just see what's going, what's their structure, and what are their moving parts, and then how to evaluate them, how to tell whether they are strong or weak. And that's the point we're going to be focusing on these variables that would affect the strength of an argument of that type. Um, you, like I said, you're going to have to make a lot of judgment calls. And on the exam for this unit and on the exercises for the homework, it's good to practice this ahead of time. It's going to be like all partial credit stuff. You're going to have to not just tell me, yep, it's doing good on that standard. Nope, it's doing bad on that standard. You'll need to be explaining your answers a lot. How did you arrive at that determination? Basically, in those explanations, I'm going to be looking for evidence that you know what you're talking about with regard to that criteria or standard. You're going to have to basically demonstrate your understanding of it um, in how you explain your use of that principle. So uh, you're going to want to already just set your expectations for explaining your thinking as much as possible. It's going to be very similar to what you had to do here for exam one uh, with um, explaining how the conversational implication is generated. Like how did you get from the literal meaning to the implied meaning or the steps in logic there using a system of principles, the Gricean maxims and Paul Grice's whole theory of how where implication comes from, um, your answers to that question, how to explain the conversational implication, give me a window into seeing how, how much you actually understand what's going on here. And that's going to be the same kind of game of what's going to happen in exam two with these inductive arguments. Um, lots of explaining what you're doing. So be prepared for that. Um, it's not going to be as simple as like, yep, good, nope, bad. It's going to be like, I think it's doing pretty good here because it's doing this and it's fill, filling this part. That's what that principle is about. I mean, that kind of thing. You'll have to walk it through. And you'll see some examples here. We'll talk through some examples. But that's the game we're going to be playing. Um, so we're back to the world of fuzziness. And again, like most things in informal logic, we're trying to take something fuzzy and just make it slightly less fuzzy as much as we possibly can. A lot of the criteria that we're going to talk about, you also, like I said, are, are, it might be pretty familiar. So the other main theme from the class is definitely in full effect in this unit, which is to take what's implicit and make it explicit. We want to be able to define in a principled way and to be able to articulate, like in your explanations of your answers, how that reasoning is coming together. How does this fit? Why is this the right evaluation of what's going on here? So that's what we're going to be up to. Um, let me pull up my lecture notes, and you can see what I'm talking about. Oops, that's not it. There we go. Minimize there, you can see my face again. So we have uh, four topics, really five arguments. Statistical generalizations, statistical applications. Then we're going to talk about this causal argument stuff, and I'm hoping to get through Maybe maybe we can get through both of these things today. Let's see. We'll see how how fast this goes. Um, the causal arguments are going to be involved with Chapter Nine and what the book calls the sufficient condition test and the necessary condition test. And we're going to go back to conditionals. And you might remember sufficiency and necessity from our logic unit. Um, and we're actually going to use some formal logic to help us understand this type of inductive reasoning. This is probably. Uh, like you might be familiar with statistical generalizations and applications from taking a stats class. Um, you might be familiar with what's going on in the sort of logic of causal arguments from doing science fair projects or you're like what what my guess is most of you think of as the scientific method. Um, then we're going to do argument from analogy which is probably that's a very familiar argument form that you're using on a daily basis. I, I don't think I'll be telling you something that's going to be mind-blowing here. But then we've got inference, the best explanation, and this was the one I was alluding to a couple minutes ago, where it's like the thing right in front of your face that you may maybe have never thought about explicitly. And what's also super interesting about inference, the best explanation, is that uh, this reflects a lot of what scientists do and what scientific reasoning looks like. That's not what you're familiar with if you're just thinking about the scientific method in the way it would have 
been embodied in maybe some YouTube video or some popular science documentary or what you did in a science fair project maybe in middle school. Um, so inference the best explanation is super cool and uh, I, I just think it, it's just very useful. It'll help you understand if, you, if you're into science even just as a hobby like you want, like to watch YouTube videos about subatomic physics or astrophysics or evolution or something like that inference the best explanation is a huge plays a huge role in a lot of contemporary cutting-edge fields of science um, so it, it's fun to talk about um, so in the lecture notes what you'll see is uh, the type of argument we'll have a definition some examples just to get straight on what it is I'm gonna have some cool drawings for you uh, to help uh, analyze I love drawings I think they really help I'm a, a kind of visual learner uh, maybe you are too and these diagrams will be helpful for just tracking all the moving parts of arguments of these types so I'll, I'll be drawing some pictures to supplement here too and then you're gonna see these numbered bolded bullet points and these are the criteria that we're gonna be using um, to evaluate it and I've given you in the lecture notes this is straight out of the book but I'm gonna make some modifications like this one I'm gonna say don't worry about that uh, I'll talk about it but we're gonna skip that one and for example in statistical generalizations here the book just lumps together this question of is the result biased in some other way I actually want to break that down into bias from interpretation and bias from investigation I'm gonna treat those as two separate things and on the exam they'll be separated like that too uh, one thing I can tell you right now is uh, in sort of anticipating what the exam is going to be like for this material uh, I'm gonna give you a problem um, I will maybe ask you some questions about identifying it like with statistical generalizations and applications but when it comes to the evaluation you don't need to have all these criteria memorized I will be giving you them on the exam so it isn't the memorization skill that I'm training I want you to know what they are how to wield them in analysis that's the goal here not just memorizing them um, so I'll, I'm happy to give you those on the exam so you don't have to worry about that and it's really clear which set of standards you need to be using in your evaluation but we'll do that for one and then we'll go on to another one here's a statistical application definition example uh, and then the standards for evaluation and then we'll keep going like that so that's what that's where this is going all right let's talk about statistical generalizations so the book's definition says statistical generalizations are an argument that makes a claim about a reference class by citing claims about a sample of that class it generalizes from the sample to the entire class and hearing a definition like that I think is only so useful and this is where drawing is very helpful but let, let's take a look at an example here critical reasoning is a boring philosophy class therefore all philosophy classes are boring you can kind of hear probably intuitively the generalization that's being made uh, on the basis of some observed cases we're going to generalize to observed and unobserved cases that's what's going on here but let's let's really break this down let's let's draw some pictures here so we'll go to the whiteboard here so we're talking here about statistical generalizations and when the book is talking about a reference class it just means a class of stuff a big category reference class Let's get rid of that. a collection of things so in the example we had before here the reference class is philosophy classes um, I'm gonna use a couple other examples here like uh, when you want to do a poll like what do all Americans think about something Americans would be the reference class or maybe we're curious about what all Bellevue College students what's going on with them um, or uh, a certain kind of physical phenomenon like a black hole and we're gonna do some observations of some black holes to make claims about all black holes that kind of thing so the reference class is 
the big sort of category here. And then you've got a smaller class that's a part of it that we call the sample. And what a statistical generalization is doing is saying, and I'm gonna I'm gonna use this this device quite a lot here. Uh, Uh, a statistical generalization is saying that on the grounds, yeah, sorry, <laughs> got to do my drawing here. So in that example from the lecture, if the reference class was all philosophy classes, then the sample would be this critical reasoning class. You're using that, it's a, a this critical reasoning class is uh, contained in the set of all philosophy classes. Um, so it's in the sample category, this, this critical reasoning class. So what a statistical generalization is doing is saying on the basis of uh, the sample having some property, I'm going to call it property X in the example we just looked at, it would be the property is boring. So because the sample has a certain property, therefore the entire reference class has that property. And if this sounds like stereotyping, it is. <laughs> Stereotypes are statistical generalizations. They're particularly bad ones um, for a number of reasons, uh, but they fall into this argument form. And actually, I may talk about this uh, at length. When I do this uh, class uh, in person on campus, uh, under a quarter where we're not under the gun, I usually like to throw in a little bonus lecture of sorts about um, bigotry, stereotypes, prejudice, um, and how that factors into this form of inductive reasoning. Um, if you, if we'll see if we get to it, but in case we don't, or if I'm feeling sensitive about how much time, uh, if you want to hear from me on this subject, uh, let me know. The main thing I, I would talk about in that mini lecture would be uh, trying to defend the view. Again, this is a view of mine, uh, my best efforts to try to understand what's going on here. But I try to defend the view that it isn't statistical generalizations as a reasoning form that is what's ethically problematic about stereotypes, um, which we do have ethical problems with, and rightfully so. Um, but that what is sort of offensive or morally problematic about stereotypes and bigotry doesn't have to do with the generalizations themselves, but comes from other factors. Um, uh, so it's not, uh, maybe you've heard the phrase, it's not offensive if it's true. And I'm like, that is BS. <laughs> it can be true and offensive. Both of those things can happen. But the truth part, like whatever the facts are, that is not uh, it, uh, essentially uh, what's morally problematic. It's going to be these other things. That's what I would uh, give an argument for um, in in that little mini lecture. I actually didn't have that view for a long time. I uh, for for many years as, when I was younger, I thought statistical generalizations was the problem. Like this is a this is a form of reasoning we shouldn't be using. But I've definitely changed my mind on that. Um, and a lot of that has to do with actually getting more involved in issues of social justice and recognizing how important statistical reasoning is for working for positive change. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm not going to get into the lecture right now. Um, we should talk about just what statistical generalizations are first, uh, but then, then um, maybe I'll get to that or do it really quickly or something like that. But if we don't get to it and that sounds interesting to you or you're already thinking about it, there is something here to think about, and it's a very interesting discussion, and I'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, and even if I do get to get my little mini lecture and you want to talk about it more, I'd love to. This is uh, one of my favorite topics is epistemic ethics. Um, and uh, I've mentioned this from the beginning of the quarter that uh, it's not just about logic, um, but there's an ethical component here to critical thinking. Um, and I think that's important to have on the radar. Um, back to the, all the stuff with code of intellectual conduct and all that good stuff. Okay, I'm getting distracted. I am an ethicist, so 
It's easy to get me on that tangent. And there's not even anyone here provoking me. I'm just provoking myself. Okay. So uh, the form of a statistical generalization is to use a sample that you investigate, uh, a part of the reference class, to gain guidance or insight about what's going on with that reference class. So scientists are always doing this. Whenever we come up with um, a theoretical uh, proposal or hypothesis about a natural law, we're saying this is what happens with this thing everywhere based on the observations we've made of some of them. That's always what's happening. So what's going on with black holes? Well, we looked at some black holes and then generalized from there. Um, when we're trying to figure out, like we're doing like a political poll, what do Americans think about, say, gun control? Well, we're going to do a poll of some of them. We're not able to talk to every American, but we'll talk to some of them, see what is going on with them, and then generalize that. So in my diagrams, because again, I'm going to use this format for other arguments too, the circles represent sets of things, like nouns, the subject of a claim, and these lines going off that have something on the other end of them, those are properties or predicates that are true of that sample. So going back to this example we had um, here, very simple and I would say bad statistical generalization. Critical reasoning is a boring philosophy class, therefore all philosophy classes are boring. What we got here is this critical reasoning class is boring, therefore all philosophy classes are boring, also have that property. So that's just what it is. Um, I could do, um, let's, uh, oh, these properties could involve percentages. So um, let's say I'm, I'm trying to figure out, uh, well, yeah, I'm going to use this for the next argument too, but we can use this example for this one as well. Say I got a bucket of marbles, but it's not labeled. It's a big bucket. And I'm trying to figure out, like, what's the distribution of different colors uh, in the entire bucket of marbles. So the entire bucket of marbles would be, like, the reference class. And I might sample the bucket of marbles by scooping out a bunch of marbles and then see what's going on with them. So maybe I, I take a scoop and I'm like, oh, half of these marbles are blue. So the sample the, is the scoop of marbles that I've looked at. The property that's true of them is that 50% of them are blue. And so I might generalize on the basis of that to say 50% of the, uh, so the, it, with, with regard to the entire bucket of marbles, 50% of them are blue. Okay, this property. So that's what a statistical generalization is. Let's start talking about um, what makes for a good statistical generalization. So we've got some criteria here for evaluating it. I really wish there was someone in the chat so I could check in and see if this is making sense, but I'm just going to keep going. Um, I'll try to anticipate questions, but uh, we'll see. If you have questions, contact me as always. Um, I mentioned before, don't worry about this one. Should we accept the premises as being true? That's, like, in this case, you could challenge it. I, I mean, that's one reason for thinking this is a bad generalization. It just has a faulty premise. I don't think critical reasoning is boring. Maybe you disagree. We can have a debate about that. But this is part of the standards that we just already know. For any argument, for it to be a good argument, it has to have all true premises. That was criteria number one. In this unit, we're focusing on inductive strength as a standard for evaluating whether the second condition holds that the argument has a good support relation. So we're going to just treat that first one as like granted for the sake of argument. I'm not going to worry about that. Like I've said before, evaluating whether the premises are actually true, it gets, it opens up the huge can of worms of philosophical epistemology. And we aren't, we're just not able to tackle that big question here in this class. That's not what this class is focused on. We're focused instead on the reasoning, not the veracity of the premises that we're working with, um, whether we have doubts about their truth or not. That's a separate thing. Um, so we already know that whether it was deductive or inductive, the premises need to be true to have a good argument. So 
I'm not focused on this. You're not going to have to answer this on the exam. The things I do want to focus on start with this standard. Is the sample size large enough? So like I mentioned before, when it comes to evaluating these uh, inductive arguments, um, strength is going to be on a continuum. It's going to be stronger, weaker, and that's pretty fuzzy and weird. But what we can get straight on, what we can have clarity on, are what are the variables that affect that strength. And one of those variables is the size of the sample. So standard number one, I'm going to put it in red here. Basically, everything in black is going to be things that would be given to you in the problem. Like if you had an exercise problem to evaluate. Uh, everything that's in black would be given to you explicitly. Um, everything in red is stuff you've got to be thinking about that you're bringing to the table in order to do this evaluation. And you are going to have to bring a lot of things to the table here. Um, we're back in the fuzzy realm of informal logic as opposed to formal logic. And so background assumptions are going to come back with a vengeance. You're going to hear me talk about background assumptions a lot. So there's a lot of things you can't just, when you're evaluating inductive arguments, you can't just deconstruct what is there in the problem that you're being given. You're going to have to bring in other information in order to be able to make an evaluation on whether that argument is strong or weak. And there's no getting around that. So be prepared for that. Get your expectations set in the right way here. Okay, so sample size, whoa, sample size is the first criteria. And sample size is about the sample. So I'm going to draw a little arrow here. Basically, the bigger the sample, the stronger the inference. So if I'm trying to do a political poll, like I want to figure out you know, uh, um, among American voters right now, who do, which Democratic candidate do they most support? Because there's a big runoff happening right now for uh the Democratic Party nominee for president in the next election. So I want to figure out, like, who do Americans like the most? If I talk to five of my friends and then generalize to all Americans based on those five friends, eh, that's going to be a pretty bad statistical generalization. But if I'm able to talk to, say, 2,000 Americans, that's getting stronger. If we can get it up to, like, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000, that would be even stronger. Basically, the larger the sample, the more evidence I've got to work with here, the stronger the generalization. Now, as we increase the sample size, it becomes practically more difficult to actually make the argument because you have to do all the research, right? Um, so that's going to be harder to do practically. But uh, it definitely helps the argument to get stronger. That's why we'd, we'd want more evidence because it's actually contributing something rationally here to make the argument a better one. So in terms of like trying to judge how big of a sample size is good or good enough, I can't tell you about that. Um, I can't tell you. It's this cutoff right here. Depending on the thing that we're analyzing, we can pin that down a little bit more. We can, we can figure out like what would be more statistically significant based on how much range of deviation is possible, but that's going to really differ from subject to subject. And if you do advanced statistics, you there are more tools here than what I'm giving you. We're just, do, this is kind of like statistical analytics 101. Um, but uh, we can, no matter what other sophistications we've got, we still know more is better. Bigger sample size, stronger generalization. Smaller sample size, weaker generalization. Actually, this brings me to another point I want to talk about sooner or later for this unit on statistical reasoning. Um, if you've taken a stats class before, you might have been used to doing a lot of math. And I've had students report this to me, that um, they're like, I took stats. I thought this was going to be easy. And this is like telling me all sorts of stuff I'd never been told in that class. And I was, I'm always a little surprised to hear that because I think any stats class worth its salt has a duty to basically uh, give the proper impression to their students that statistical analytics is not just about the numbers stupid or something like that. It's not just about the math, um, but it's about how that math is being understood as evidence. There's a difference between information and data. Data is, needs to be interpreted before it can be mobilized as information that informs a conclusion. 
some a theme we'll be talking about with both generalizations and applications here is going to be statistical cherry picking um, which is a phenomenon you may already be familiar with that you can kind of find a stat to prove whatever you want or there's that kind of uh, concern right and so there have to be higher standards here for how we reason with statistics I think way too often we treat statistics especially ones that involve numbers much less with decimal points as almost like magic spells that provide certainty without critically thinking about how we're reasoning about those numbers that also gets into my little side topic about bigotry and stereotypes too but what we're going to be focusing on I hope would have showed up in one of your stats class and may be familiar but if it doesn't I just wanted to point that out and emphasize we're not working on the math level here we're thinking about what other things are actually a part of statistical reasoning that's not the math that affects how strong of an inference it really is whether it's an argument that holds water or doesn't hold water or how much water it does hold how much confidence should we put in it so one thing that will affect that is the sample size itself that's pretty straightforward standard um, the next one is getting a little more complicated number two is sample bias and actually to uh, and foreshadow here a little bit sample bias is going to be one of three different forms of bias that we're going to be trying to track for in in our evaluation here um, and that I think is an important point in and of itself sometimes we throw around the concept of bias I think or I, I observe in my experience we throw around this concept of bias as if it's a catch-all term like there's this phenomenon bias and it works the same way in every case or something like that the reality is that there are lots of different forms of bias and they all present different obstacles and what it takes to overcome one form of bias isn't necessarily going to help with another form of bias um, and it's important to kind of differentiate them to be tracking all the different types of dangers here if you wanted a definition from me my best effort here of like what is the bias phenomenon like what are we talking about when we're talking about bias I, I like this definition that would say bias is any type of force um, any a rational or irrational force that influences our belief formation so when belief formation is not on the basis of evidence and argument um, I can be I can make mistakes at reasoning I can do that I can be reasoning from faulty premises I can be ignorant of something and that doesn't automatically mean I'm biased um, bias is how other factors which are not related to evidence or reasoning are influencing belief formation so for example um, something like confirmation bias if I already hold a belief now I'm focused on the I, I have a bias toward recognizing or spotting things that confirm my pre-existing beliefs and it's not I, I'm not tracking for I don't notice as easily anything that uh, threatens it or criticizes it um, confirmation bias is one thing that can distort my belief formation and maybe even my reasoning efforts in a way that's not rational or is not a part of the rational game of critical truth-seeking um, so that's what I, I like to identify as bias um, it, are those kinds of forces and we're gonna see three very different ways in which those forces could look or where they could be coming from that would interfere with our effort our rational efforts here with the logic of a statistical generalization that would undermine its strength its inductive strength um, yeah, I, I, some, I don't want to go too far in this tangent, but I sometimes have complained that I'm like, the way I hear some people throwing around the word bias uh, in everyday conversation is they kind of use it for cases where they recognize there's a pattern to someone's thinking and they don't like that pattern, so they call it a bias. And I think we need to have a little bit more rigorous uh, definition or understanding of what bias is. Because um, in patterned reasoning, or a pattern or consistency to someone's beliefs might actually be the good thing like that's what we're looking for you're not like contradicting yourself you don't have contradictory beliefs that's that's an important thing for um, defending beliefs right as being um, justified legitimate 
So anyway, um, okay. So that's a little bit about bias here. But what is sample bias? How? Is, what is the phenomenon here that we're worried about? Sample bias is worried about what of the reference class are we looking at in order to gain guidance about that reference class? Because that's what statistical generalization is doing, right? I want to use the sample as my guide for getting insight about the reference class. So let's use a little example here. Let's say I want to figure out what all Americans think about gun control. If I only talk to members of the NRA, the National Rifle Association, that would be sample bias. Why? For two reasons. And this is part of the definition of sample bias. First condition that must be met for sample bias to be present is that there has to be something going on with this sample that's not representative of the reference class. And that's clearly happening here. Not uh, all Americans are members of the NRA. Only some Americans are members of the NRA. Okay? And maybe some Russians. No, I'm <laughs> um, oh, that's true. Uh, so that's the first condition, that there has to be some some kind of way in which the sample's not representative of the reference class. But secondly, that in itself is not bad, uh, unless the second condition is also met. That the way in which the sample is not representative of the reference class is relevant to property X, whatever is this predicate or property that we're making judgments about. So I, to evaluate sample bias, You've got to be looking at the sample, comparing it against the reference class with an eye, sorry, this drawing is getting weird, with an eye, let's draw it like this, to uh, property X. So let's go back for a second. Um, and do the NRA example again here. So first condition is met. If I'm only talking to members of the NRA, that's not representative of all Americans because not all Americans are members of the NRA. Um, is the way, is, the, is being a member of the NRA or not, second condition, relevant to people's opinions about gun control? Yes, clearly. How do I know that? Background assumptions. So this is the first place in which background assumptions come into the picture. I have to use my knowledge of the world and how it works to be able to make a judgment of whether this difference or discrepancy between the sample and the reference class has a relevance connection with the property in question. I need to do that. There's no other way I can evaluate that unless I import my background assumptions about the world. Can I be wrong in those? Yes. I can be wrong in my background assumptions about the world. Those can be fallible. Those can be controversial, which is why even figuring out whether an inductive argument is strong or weak is something that is fallible. Not only are inductive arguments themselves fallible, even if you're doing everything right, you can still get a false conclusion. Um, even evaluating them is fallible. Because of our difference in background assumptions, you might think an argument is good and I think it's bad. But that doesn't mean this isn't worth learning or uh, developing competency with this kind of evaluative technique. One of the big benefits of doing so, and, and this is why I'm setting up the exam problems the way I am where you have to explain yourself so much, is if you can articulate the basis of your thought process or reasoning in evaluating an inductive argument, then you can share that with somebody else. And then you can see if you and I, if two people, you and the other person, disagree based on those differences in the background assumptions. So it can give you, if you're able to articulate this, instead of it just being like a gut check of like, uh, sounds like BS to me, or makes sense to me. If you can articulate the underlying basis on how you arrived at that evaluation, now debate can be way more productive. Because if, if someone's like, that may, argument makes sense to me, and the other person's like, that argument does make sense to me. Then it's like, okay, I guess we think differently. There's not much more you can do. Being like, I don't see why this doesn't make sense to you. And the other person's like, I don't see why this makes sense to you. right? But if we can talk about, if we can unpack and make explicit 
that implicit stuff that's going on in the back of our heads. If we can be self-reflective and self-aware and understanding, yeah, these are the assumptions that I'm using applied with this standard to arrive at this evaluation, and you can make that accessible to another person to understand your thinking, now we can really move forward productively in that debate and maybe sort out our disagreement where at the end of the debate, kind of like Code of Intellectual Conduct, we're like, oh yeah, now we're, we're really putting all the chips on the table and comparing notes. I was like, oh yeah, you're right about that. My initial evaluation was forgetting about that. That's a really important point. I see that now. I was wrong. We can get to that kind of point of resolving something that was an initial rational disagreement. So that's why we're doing all this. And, and why the presence of background assumptions making things fallible doesn't sort of invalidate this whole thing. It's still very useful and helpful. So uh, you might be wondering about that second condition. So with the example we did with the NRA, this is a clear case of sample bias. Um, not all Americans are members of the NRA. And being a member of the NRA or not definitely has a relevant connection with what your opinions about gun control are going to be. In many ways, the NRA is a political organization about advocating for gun rights. So it's definitely relevant, right? There's that connection. But take this example. Um, take the example uh, where I'm still trying to figure out what all Americans think about gun control. And the sample that I collect, uh, I only talk to people who love bananas. Well, if I'm testing that for sample bias, um, there really isn't sample bias going on here. The first condition's met. The sample's not representative of the reference class because not all Americans like bananas. But the second condition isn't met. Um, whether or not you like bananas really has nothing to do with gun control or your opinion about gun control. I don't see any connection there. My background assumptions don't allow me to make a relevant connection there. The biggest thing I can come up with is that like a banana you can like kind of hold like a gun kind of looks like a gun. I don't see how that would really influence anyone's opinion, though. So the fact that the way in which the sample was not representative of the reference class doesn't have anything to do with this property means whether the sample reflects the reference class in that respect just doesn't matter. It's not a threat of sample bias. Um, that's important. Uh, we can't track for every single detail. Like, um, if you're trying to do a political poll, what are the things that they're really careful about? Age, ethnicity, religious orientation, party affiliation, um, educated, not educated, all these kinds of variables that might be relevant to what a person's political position is or political opinion is. Um, but there's a lot of other things they don't do, like, oh, we got to get the right proportion of people who wear hats versus people who don't wear hats, or people who like to drink tea versus coffee or people who um, know how to swim versus people who don't know how to swim. I mean, there's all these other variables that they just, they can't track and they don't need to track. It's not going to be relevant to this uh, trying to make a strong generalization. So while there are a lot of things that do count and they're trying to be careful about all those things, there's a lot of other forms uh, of uh, ways in which a sample might not be representative of the reference class that don't amount to sample bias. I'm really emphasizing this because it's my experience on the exam answers that students don't follow through on this. Uh, it very frequently I talk about it, but then they don't uh, pick it up. So if you're going to explain on your exam answers, you have to say like, yep, I think there's sample bias, or no, I don't think there's sample bias you're going to have to address both of those two theoretical conditions before you say there is sample bias. And you can use those to explain why you don't think there's sample bias, too, if you don't, if you think there isn't any. Okay, so that's what's going on with sample bias. Um, it takes a little bit of analysis here. Okay, one other thing I have to add to this picture that isn't here in the problem and oftentimes is absent is data. And I'm going to put that like this. Okay. And I'm going to do some drawing here. So there's one other variable to how statistical, or one other mechanism that's involved in how statistical generalizations work. 
And that's going to be related to drawing this distinction between the next two standards for evaluating a statistical generalization. So we got number three, bias in investigation. And then number four, bias in interpretation. And let's go here. Bias in investigation is worried about this step. And bias in interpretation is worried about this step. OK, so what am I depicting here? Um, I'm going to use a little bit more complicated example now because I, I think it's it's a useful one. Statistical generalizations can look as simple as like a political poll, like who are you going to vote for in the next election? Republican, Democrat, Independent. Check one, right? But sometimes we want to investigate some more complicated things. And I don't know how many of you have taken classes in sociology or empirical psychology or something like that. But especially in sociology, there's some really good examples here. Um, sometimes when I'm doing this in, on, in cam uh, on campus, in uh, on campus class version, I can like ask students like, hey, what, what projects have you had to do, like research projects for a sociology class? And if you're trying to figure out like what's going on with all Americans or all Bellevue College students or something like that, um, you're going to have to find some people to study. But then you have to investigate them somehow. You can't just put them in a room and look at them and figure out what's up with them. You need some access. You need some window onto their situation. You need to collect some data. And then you need to interpret that data to figure out whether the sample has this property or not. Like what are the results of your study? So I'm going to use this example that a student gave me a few years back. I, I like it. I was asking everyone like, you know, the, who's taking a sociology class? Did you have to do a research project? What did you do? And the student had a very complicated project, so I'm going to simplify it down a little bit. Uh, it's still complicated, but a little it's a richer example, but I am simplifying a little bit from what they originally said. But take this one. Um, the student wanted to do a study, uh, and they wanted to figure out, like, what percentage of Bellevue College students are sexual deviants? And by sexual deviant, we only mean, we don't mean that in the pejorative sense here, we just mean in that they have... Uh, they have a sexual lifestyle or sexual behaviors that don't fit with the dominant cultural norms of like maybe what is acceptable. So the fact that they're maybe countercultural here or not doing things the way that society prescribes it to be doesn't mean that they're doing something wrong or immoral or something like that. Um, not automatically. It just means that they're doing something different, off the norm. That's all we mean by deviant in this context. Um, so, uh, the student was talking about how, like, yeah, you can't just, like, do a survey with students and be like, are you a sexual deviant? Check yes or no. <laughs> it's, that's not going to be a great way to investigate what is going on with the sample. You're going to have to get a little more clever. And this is a long-standing axiom of psychological and uh, social studies kind of research, is that when people know what your uh, research study is about, that changes their answers. They don't answer as honestly or as accurately. Um, they're like trying to get inside the head of the researchers or something, or, or they start performing or presenting themselves in a different way. So you have to sometimes make it unclear what you're actually studying or have a distraction almost, like, oh, you think we're studying this, but we're actually studying this other thing that you're not noticing. Um, there's a lot of kind of sneaky tactics that are used in these research methods. Um, and one way that's not super sneaky, but it's just um, a classic technique, is that you just have a lot of red herrings. So you give a questionnaire, and it's asking about all sorts of different questions. And then the one, you're not really interested in most of them, but the one that you are interested, it's in there. It's, it's snuck in there. Um, and that's what this student did. And they, they asked roundabout questions. Um, instead of this like really direct question. If they'd asked it directly, the concern is that there's going to be bias in investigation. That the data collected, so this is a definition of bias in investigation, the data collected does not accurately represent what's true of the sample. 
So they got a little more clever with it. Um, they asked their questions in a roundabout way, put a bunch of red herrings in there as a way to collect data that has a better chance of being accurate. And again, your concerns about what are the things that could be interfering with this step of the process, what could be distorting the data, really is going to get informed by your background assumptions of how people work, how the world works, stuff like that. Um, I think bias in investigation is very noticeable in human situations. It doesn't have to be a human situation. Um, like if you're doing a physics lab and your instruments are not calibrated properly or your microscope is blurry or has a scratch on the lens or something like that, then that also would be bias in investigation. It yields data that doesn't accurately reflect what's going on. Like if you're weighing things but the spring in the, in the, um, the uh, levers are is like broken or distended or something, then it's going to give a, a inaccurate, an inaccurate reading. Um, so your whole generalization based on this experimental data that you're collecting is going to be off, right? So, or uh, I also like this example. If you go to your physics lab drunk and like make mistakes in how you're like writing down the information as you're doing the experiments, that also would be biased in investigation because you are also an instrument that's a part of the process, the human instrument. Uh, and if you're operating in a faulty way, um, the data that is recorded will maybe not accurately reflect the sample. I remember going to physics labs in college and there were people who totally showed up drunk or high uh, to, say, to try to make the lab more interesting or something, I don't know, or they're just alcoholics. Um, but that could yield uh, faulty data, right? So it could be any kind of force that interferes with how you're gaining a window or observing the sample. In the case of the, the poll of like, are you what are you going to vote in the next presidential election? Democrat, Republican, Independent, check one, um, or whichever ones you're considering or something like that. Getting the data is pretty straightforward. There's not as many concerns about there being some force of bias here that's going to distort the results. So again, this is going to be contextualized and based on background information. Actually, I got one more really good example that I like to use. So at the end of the quarter, you're going to have a survey sent out from Canvas to do the instructor evaluations. And there's a reason that they're set up the way that they are. They're done anonymously, and I'm not the one, you don't have to tell it to me directly. I will get to see the answers, but after grades are submitted, and they'll be anonymous. And the whole goal here is that that's going to get more honest answers. The data collected from you, the students, will more accurately represent how you actually feel about the class and how good it was and about me as the teacher. Um, this you could contrast, that'd be like a good way to avoid bias in investigation. Contrast that with a, a situation where I just go up to, I like I get my class in front of me, say on campus, and I'm like, do you think I'm a good teacher? So I've got the samples, I've got the students, they're the right kinds of students, right? They're students I've had, they would know or they, they would, they're in a position to be able to have some insight about this. Um, but if I just ask them directly, if I ask all of you directly, am I going to get accurate data? Probably not. Maybe some of you will have the courage to just like tell me your opinion. If it's a negative opinion, you'll just be like, yeah, I think you're a bad teacher, Tim. I think you screw up this. I think you do this poorly. You know, you might, might have the courage to do that. But I've got background assumptions about how people work where people don't like to do that. It's like creating co interpersonal conflict. It, it could threaten something. Um, and it rocks the boat. It creates disharmony. It's not as nice. You know, there's all these other motives that might uh, cause us to hesitate on just being like, yep, here's my negative opinion, if, if you have one. Um, I'm much more likely to get people being like, you're great. Yeah, great. Great. Right? And not necessarily given the full honest truth of it. Um, probably students who do think I'm a good teacher are going to be happy to share that information. So not all the data will be faulty, but if there are any critical things out there, my background assumptions tell me people might not share it, right? That there, there are motivations that would keep them from doing that. Or they might downplay it. They might minimize the extent of their dissatisfaction with my teaching. So 
how we observe the sample is how we collect data. And we want to make sure that that data, those observations, accurately reflect what's going on with the sample. Okay, but let's say we're in one of these more complicated situations, like my student who was uh, doing that study on sexual deviance. If you have to collect your data, data in a sneaky way, you can't just like ask directly and explicitly, now that's going to set up a situation where inferring a result or drawing a conclusion about what was true about that sample becomes a little more complicated and is going to require interpretation. Again, if we were doing the political poll, this is really straightforward. They just look at which box they checked. I mean, there, it doesn't take rocket science to interpret what that reflects about their opinion. Um, but in the case of like doing this massive questionnaire, asking all these roundabout questions, the researcher, my student, who did this study, has to look at those answers and be like, does this answer provide adequate evidence to justify saying, yes, this person is a sexual deviant or no? Right? If it's more suggestive and, and less direct, there's going to be some interpretation that's required. Now, the book, I think, doesn't explain this in the most accurate way. So I'm going to try to make up for what I think are some of its failures. But when it's talking about bias in interpretation of moving from the data to this property X conclusion about the sample, um, it talks about this is where the role of prejudice comes in, pre-judgment, prejudice that you already know what conclusion you want to draw and so you interpret the data in a way that's favorable to that. Um, and the problem here isn't that you have prior judgments that are influencing your interpretation. That's not the problem. And in fact, there would be no way to do an interpretation without some background assumptions that you're using as a part of your interpretation. Without background assumptions, I don't know what the data is telling me, right? If without making those connections, I can't, a lot, the data can't guide me to a conclusion. So the problem here is not with using assumptions as a part of that interpretation, but using assumptions as a part of that interpretation which don't allow the data to guide us to what conclusion we ought to draw. So imagine. I'm using some background assumptions that um, no matter how the data worked out, I would interpret it as having property X. That would be prejudice. But I want assumptions that set up an arrangement. I have background knowledge of the world that sets up an arrangement that allows the data, if it works out this way, I draw this conclusion. If it works out this way, I draw this conclusion. We want assumptions that empower the data to guide us to what conclusion we ought to draw, that it's leading us there. But it doesn't lead us, the, the data itself doesn't lead us there all by itself. It, it needs some support in every case. Um, maybe those assumptions are very small, like that the person who took the survey for the political poll understands the instructions, you know, so that they understand putting a check in the box means I'm selecting this this is the one rather than the things I'm not selecting or some, something like that. Those are pretty minor, um, but those are still important as a part of interpreting the poll result data that we collected. So um, that that's the right use of them. The bad use is um, when the background assumptions that we have take us to the conclusion directly regardless of what data we would have collected uh, or how it could have turned out. Um, forms of bias and in interpretation are hard uh, um, sometimes to spot as like a smoking gun. I think when you do some of the homework problems, you'll see this. And even the exam problems are going to be kind of like this. Most of the time, you see this is all in red. Most of the time, the problem itself is not going to tell you how the investigation was conducted or how they went about the interpretation. So you're not going to have, you can't wait for a smoking gun here. You need to use your imagination. Um, and your background assumptions of the world to figure out like what could maybe go wrong here, what am I suspicious of, something like that. There's this awesome problem from the homework that I'll, I'll run through right now. Uh, it says, uh, um, oh, I'm just going to pull it up here. One second. Okay, here we go. Do, 
here we go. Kmart asked all of their customers throughout the country whether they prefer Kmart to Walmart, and 90% said they did. So 90% of all shoppers in the country prefer Kmart. Let's just get this straight on our thing here. So Kmart asked all of its shoppers throughout the country, so that's the sample, all the shoppers they talked to throughout the country, what they thought about preferring Kmart to Walmart. 90% of them, what did it say, 90%? Yeah, 90% said that they prefer Kmart to Walmart, so we're going to say that they, they did, right? That's property X. 90% of the sample um, prefer Kmart to Walmart. Therefore, 90% of all shoppers in the country prefer Kmart to Walmart. Okay, so it's a statistical generalization. It's fitting this model. Sample size. Probably pretty good. If Kmart asks all of its shoppers, that's a lot of shoppers. Um, I'm suspicious whether they actually were able to do this. So maybe that size is a little smaller, but I have no reason for being worried about that. Sample bias. Hell yeah. Definitely some sample bias here. Because they only talked to people who shop at Kmart. Not all shoppers in the country shop at Kmart. Is that relevant for whether you prefer Kmart to Walmart? Uh, yeah, yeah. Not necessarily in every case. Someone might shop at Kmart just because it's the nearest place. But they would rather shop at Walmart, right? Um, but is their preferences going to affect where they shop? Yes. So there's definitely sample bias. Both things are checked, right? Is samples not representative of the reference class and in a way that's relevant to the property in question, property X. Is there bias in investigation? Yes, I'm very suspicious of it at least because Kmart's the one doing the study. So it's kind of like me asking you if you think I'm a good instructor. If Kmart's asking its customers, do you like Kmart, then they might say yes even if they don't mean it, right? They don't want to be like, I hate this place. Thank you for the groceries, <laughs> something like that. Um, but the biggest thing I'd be concerned about that, again, I don't know how Kmart ran its study. I don't know how it interpreted its results, but I'm definitely suspicious of bias and in interpretation here because I'm worried about conflict of interest. Kmart's the one doing the study. Do they have some investment in how that study works out? Yeah. I mean, if it's true or they're able to demonstrate through a statistic that most people for her Kmart to Walmart, that's a great advertising fodder, right? That's a great thing to be making public. Um, it's going to encourage more business. And they have an investment in that, right? So I'm really suspicious that I don't know for certain, but I'd be worried that this conflict of interest presents the opportunity for Kmart to be interpreting whatever data it collected in a way that's more favorable to Kmart than is maybe warranted, um, that we'd want to let the data guide us to that. And they might be massaging it in a way that creates a more favorable outcome for them. This is also the same reason why I'd be suspicious of big tobacco companies um, funding research into cancer and the, the relationship between smoking and cancer. There's a huge bias in interpretation there if they're the ones bankrolling that research, right, because of that conflict of interest. So that's an example about how to deal with statistical generalizations, all these different forms of uh, evaluation, the criteria that we have to use to evaluate statistical generalizations, and I got you a little example. But be prepared. On the exam, you will probably not receive a smoking gun when it comes to these sorts of things. But you can still articulate to me an evaluation that demonstrates of what you're concerned about, that demonstrates uh, your understanding of what this is and what this is. Keeping all these things separated in your mind is very important. And if after reading the book and listening to my lecture today, you're like, yeah, these are getting confused with each other for me. I don't see the sharp lines that divide them as being different from each other. Call me up. We should talk about that. Um, I'm, I'm trying to make that really cle clean and clear. Um, I hope this diagram helps too. Um, but but um, if it doesn't, let me know and we can clear that up some more. Okay, I'm going to take a short break and then I'm going to come back for applications. All right, here we go with statistical applications, which will look very familiar. See, we got the reference class again. Um, we've got a smaller uh, subcategory of the reference class. In the statistical generalizations, we were calling this the sample. This time, we call it the subset. But functionally, it's the same. I mean, it's just a, a category of things 
that is contained within this other category of things. Sorry about that. I had to sneeze. Woo. That just attacked me out of nowhere. Um, okay, so, yeah, just category of things contained inside another category of things. Um, but you'll notice that the arrow is reversed. So where before we were using what was going on with the sample as the basis for understanding what's happening with the reference class, this time we're using what we know about the reference class to gain insight about the subset. Um, so what, what's happening here? Um, let, let's go back to my lecture notes here. We can look at an example. And here's a definition um, from the book. Book defines statistical applications as an argument that makes a claim about a particular subset of a reference class by citing claims about the reference class. So the general form looks like this. A certain percentage or ratio of Fs, that's the reference class, have feature G, or in my diagram here, X. Okay. A, the subset, is an F. In other words, it's in the category of the reference class. Therefore, it also has the feature in question for me, X. Okay, so what we got that all in the diagram. A certain percentage or ratio of the reference class has this property in question. Therefore, this subset, which is a member of the reference class, also has that property. Okay, that's the logic here. Let's do an example, though, because um, these kind of abstract formalizations don't always get it. Um, and this is a this percentage thing might this is a new element from the diagram that we had for statistical generalizations. But I, I actually before I do an example, I want to just say this before I forget. On the exam, I will be asking you to you'll I'll be giving you problems uh, on in this section about statistical generalizations and applications. I'll give you an argument, a passage of, of an argument. And the first question I'll ask you is, is it a generalization or an application? I'll also ask you, what's the reference class, and what's the sample slash subset? What's the smaller category? So you have to identify those. And if you're trying to figure out whether something is a statistical generalization or an application, do not think about whether there's a percentage involved. Um, that's, a, that's misleading. Think about the direction of the arrow. Is the claim about the reference class the premise? Then it's an application. Or is it the conclusion? then it's a generalization. So if the reference class is being cited as a claim that's giving support for the conclusion, then it's going to be an application. If it's the thing receiving support when this arrow is flipped, that was a generalization. That's the way to do it. The reason why you can't treat the percentage here, even though this is a new element for applications, is like some of the examples we talked about for generalizations. They can talk about percentages. Um, a percentage of the sample could be what property X is, like 90% prefer Kmart to Walmart, or a certain percentage of, of people uh, approve of some kind of gun control or something like that. So just because there's talk of percentages doesn't mean it's automatically an application. You can't use that as the definitive mark or piece of evidence here. The other thing um, is that you may not get a percentage in numbers. You might not say like 90% or something. Um, it might just say almost all, or very few, or next to none, or the worst is most. Because <laughs> most, you're like, does that mean 51%, or does it mean 99%, or anywhere in between? Okay, but we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, let me give you an example. So let's go back to that marble jar. Okay, let's say uh, here at the marble jar situation, different situation than before. I just have a jar of marbles. But there's a label on it that says, now with 95% blue marbles. Well, if I know that 95% of the marbles in the jar, which is the reference class, has the property of being blue, then if I were to dip my hand into that jar and pick one out, I would be in a pretty good position to make the judgment that that marble I pick out, the subset, is blue. Now, does it definitively prove that? No, but this is inductive reasoning. Does the fact that 95% of the 
the marbles in the in the uh, jar are blue give me good reason to think that the next marble I pluck out is blue yes right um, it gives it gives some supporting evidence for that it makes it more likely uh, statistical application would be something that you'd be using let's say you're a basketball coach and it's the very end of the basketball game and there's time for one more play and you're down by one point and you're like okay we're gonna drop a play here to get a shot off before the time runs out who do we want to take that shot All right who are you gonna pick out um, to take that shot well you're gonna wanna pick the person who's got the best shooting percentage why because if you take the entire reference class of all of the shot attempts they've ever made, what percentage of them did they make? And if that number is high, there's a greater chance that the next shot, which would be a subset of that reference class, will be made. Right? You'll score the points. Okay? So that's the case of statistical applications. Just as a general observation about this, now that we've got applications and generalizations both on the table, um, there's kind of a, uh, a funny thing, right? You're like, well, the arrows are going back and forth. Is this setting up some kind of like circular situation, circular reasoning? And not really. I mean, it could, but um, I like to think about it like breathing. Statistical generalizations and applications are like a cycle of, of rational processes that we're doing every day constantly. As I have more experiences, I generalize based on those experiences and then I take those generalizations and then I apply them to my next experiences to figure out what's going to happen with them and in and out we go back and forth generalizing applying that generalization back and forth back and forth um, and and they're both very very useful uh, what good is it for me to know about those generalizations unless I'm capable of applying them into particular situations um, the, the usefulness of knowing a player's shooting percentage is to think about how to strategize around that, right? If I know a player shoots um, a higher percentage of layups, uh, they're, they're really effective, they're above league average around the rim versus three-point shooting, then I want them to take shots in the paint. I don't want them taking longer shots, so we won't build that into the strategy. If there's a player that's above league average at three-point shooting and is maybe shoots a higher percentage in the paint, but not a, not a one that's like a league average sort of thing, then you want them shooting three-pointers. I'm sorry for the basketball metaphor here, but in case you don't know as much about basketball, but uh, maybe you get the point here, the illustration. If, if I... Um, let, here's a good example of the breathing in and out. I don't have a car. I take the bus everywhere. And I learn bus schedules. And I learn bus schedules not always because of what's reported, but based on my experience. Like there are certain buses that are you know, notoriously late all the time or early or something like that. And as I have experiences of the bus on this day, on this day, on this day, then I start to generalize. Okay, I'm like, okay, this bus is always five minutes late. Now, is it always going to be five minutes late just based on my past experience? No, but that generalization, while fallible, is pretty well warranted. And then I want to take that general information and apply it to a particular situation. So let's say I'm looking at the bus schedule time and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to get down there in time. But will I get down there in time to actually catch the real bus? I might use my general knowledge that, oh, this bus is generally five minutes late to think, yeah, I'll be able to catch the bus and I should go down there and I'll, I'll hit that one. I don't need to wait around for the next one. That would be a case of using my generalized knowledge about how this bus generally works and applying it into a particular case, the current situation, in order to arrive at a judgment. Um, that's what makes generalized laws useful why we do physics right we create generalized laws and then we can apply them for like building this particular bridge that kind of thing so in and out we go we, we go back and forth between generalizations and applications okay so that's what applications are this is their moving parts uh, how do we evaluate them so now let's talk about that standard number one oops has to do with the percentage and 
and I'm going to do this, 0 to 100. This standard is really straightforward. Um, basically, the closer that the cited percentage here, or whatever informal way of indicating it, the closer it is to 100% or to 0, the stronger. If it's in the 50-50 range, that's terrible. That's not helpful. So going back to the bucket example, uh, the bucket of marbles example, if it says 95% blue marbles, that's pretty good, right? That gives me a stronger reason to think that the next one I pick out is going to be blue. Um, if, it's, if it said like 1% blue marbles, that's great because that puts me in a position to say that the subset will not have that feature. It won't be blue. If I pull one out, chances are it's not going to be blue. If it's 50-50, then I've got no rational preference either way, right? 50-50 would mean the, uh, the chances of my whatever rational basis I have for thinking the next one's going to be blue is the exact same as it not being blue. So, and, and then there's the range of you know, probabilities in between that. So 60% is, well, it's a little bit better. It gives me a, a little bit more reason to think it will be blue versus not blue. Um, but it's going to get stronger. I'm in a stronger position to draw that conclusion, to make that, say, prediction, um, if it's really close to 100 or 0. So that's the first thing that affects, again, the continuum of strength for, for this type of inductive argument, a statistical application. There's pretty much nothing more to say about that. Um, definitely when you give me your answer on this, it'll ask, uh, what, is, what is the percentage cited in the premises? Keep in mind, you've got to demonstrate that you know what this standard is asking for and how it actually works. So your answer better include something like, and it doesn't take much here, but just something to indicate to me that you know that the argument is stronger if, it's, if the percentage is close to zero or 100% and weaker if it's more in the 50-50 range. Okay, that's it. Um, that one shouldn't take very much time. However, the next one will. A lot of the weight of statistical applications, and this goes back to statistical cherry picking, um, has to do with is the reference class cited the most relevant for determining whether the subset has the claimed feature. Now that's a really long name, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to put it all out there because uh, I want you to think about it in this level of detail. So the second standard, the relevance of the reference class, really involves you asking yourself this question. Why is this a question? Again. When you're evaluating inductive arguments, you're going to have to think outside the box. You're going to have to think about your background assumptions and all the other stuff that's not necessarily given to you in the problem. Again, everything in black, everything in black here, that's all stuff you'd get out of, say, the homework exercise or the exam problem. Everything in red is stuff you've got to be thinking about. So if the logic of, I'm going to approach explaining this this way. If the logic of a statistical application is like, um, I'm trying to figure out, does the subset have property X or not? Is it blue? Is the marble going to be blue? Is it going to be not blue, one way or the other? Um, I might look at what I know about categories that include that thing, then, and then figure out, well, what's going on with that reference class? And that will maybe be the guide. But the fact is, subsets exist in lots of different reference classes there are tons of them out here. There are other reference classes we could have chosen other than the one that was chosen for the argument. And you have to ask, if you're trying to figure out whether the subset has this feature or not, are you looking in the right place? Is this reference class the one we really should be consulting as the best indicator for whether or not the subset has that feature or not? Okay, And that's what we mean by saying, is a reference class cited the most relevant for determining whether the subset has the claimed feature. Let me explain this through use of an illustration and an example, because I, I really like this one for capturing this. And it makes a little bit more sense if we saw each other in person, but I, I guess you had the intro video at the beginning of the quarter. But okay, so the way I do this one is um, first day of class, 
um, I walked in the door, or you watched the video, and you might be wondering, is Tim going to be a good teacher or not? I remember being a student, and I remember having that question in every single class I took, because I had some bad teachers, and I was like, are you going to be a bad teacher or not? I, and certainly, there some classes I'd take no matter what, but there's some classes it's like, if the teacher sucks, then I want to drop this class. <laughs> like, I don't, I wouldn't care to take this class from a bad teacher or something like that. I want to, I want to be happy about who I'd be working with that quarter with that subject. I've taken some classes from bad teachers and just done it because I'm like, I can teach myself this and I care about this material. I want to do this. But let's say you're in that boat. So you have a motivation here for trying to figure out whether I'm a good teacher or not. Um, what do you got to work with? Well, you can make some observations of me, um, certain features that I might have. And then you might think back to like, well, how many of the teachers that had that feature were good teachers? Okay, so... Uh, I don't know, we could pick all sorts of things here. I, I love having a classroom to talk about with this because I can ask questions like, well, what are the features that you look at, right? What are the things that you think are indicators here of being a good teacher or a bad teacher? So the reference class would be composed of teachers that had that property. So I'm just going to choose something goofy here. Like, I'm a Star Trek fan. Tim loves Star Trek. Tim is in the is a subset he's a member of the class of teachers who like Star Trek and then you might consult your experience or your general knowledge and be like okay what percentage of teachers who like Star Trek are good teachers good teachers being property X here and then that might give you some insight about this but probably whether or not your teacher likes Star Trek is not the most relevant feature for determining whether Tim is going to be a good teacher or whoever the teacher is that you're making the judgment about. You might want to look at something else. Maybe what are some things that are more relevant? Maybe well prepared, uh, energetic, friendly, um, articulate, maybe all sorts of things, right? Uh, experienced, um, young maybe versus old. I've had I've had some really good old teachers. I've had some really bad old teachers, too, in terms of how the percentages. Maybe it speaks more that way, or there's a certain age. I don't know. Anyway, whatever it is, right, you're going to have to use your background assumptions, your knowledge mainly about property X. Like, what are the sorts of things that are the most reliable indicators to confirm or disconfirm the presence of this property? Are we looking at the right reference class? This is where statistical cherry picking comes in, where people just choose a reference class that presents a statistic that's close to 100 or 0 that applies to the thing that they want to draw a certain conclusion about to make it look like that thing has that feature. But they might be looking, they might be barking up a, really the wrong tree or not the most relevant tree. And that's why it's not just about the numbers, right? It depends about the context here. And that relies on our background assumptions about property X, whatever that is, the disputed quality. Um, so that's what you have to think about. And it's going to take some more creative thinking here. And you'll have to report in your answers and your explanations about like how you're sorting this out. If you think it's not the most relevant, the, the reference class chosen is not the most relevant one, a great way to work, uh, something you can add to your explanation to make it a good one, would be to talk about which re uh, reference classes you think they should have used instead. That's a great way to do it. Um, uh, if you think it's a really good reference class, then talk about what's that ground of the connection that is the, the sort of basis for the reference class being relevant to property X. Okay, So that's what we're doing there. Uh, and in fact, I should draw this little. Here we go. And that's pretty, what I, pretty much what I got to say about statistical applications. Um, yeah, I don't think I have anything more I, I need to say. We did a lot of stuff with generalizations just because we were setting everything up. Um, yeah, let me let me pause the video for a second and think about what more I might want to get into this video. Okay, I thought about it and I think I think this is what I'm going to do. Um, 
I think I am going to record a video this weekend. So a couple videos coming up here soon. One is the the kind of demonstration of some of the chapter six uh, homework problems, um, where you can see me doing some formal logic a little bit more. Um, so that'll that'll happen either tonight or tomorrow. And then Saturday, I think. Saturday, I'll record another little bonus video to cover the SCT NCT section, or basically the chapter nine material on causal arguments. And that'll be a shorter one. Um, that unit, I, I don't. It's definitely not going to take two hours. It'll probably be more like an hour. Um, but I think I'll knock that out so that next Tuesday can just be uh, argument from analogy and inference of the best explanation. Um, and I think that's that's probably the best way to do it. Rather than trying to sneak in um, uh, causal reasoning here or do half of it in this video, I don't think that makes sense. I'm we're at a hundred or I'm an hour and forty five minutes, so I don't think I'll do that. But I think what I will do is use some of this space just to do a little bit of that, uh, give you a little picture of, of that um, bonus lecture on statistical generalizations, uh, stereotypes, and bigotry that I was alluding to earlier. Uh, and if this is something you want to talk about more, we can follow up on it more. But I'll, I'll throw that in there really quickly. And um, what should we do for a code word? I should put that in here before I forget. Um, well, let's just do bananas. Banana lover, something like that. Bananas or banana lover. I said both. Dang it. Either one will be fine. If you have something about bananas, I'll know that's the code for this video. Okay. So I'll just leave you with the, with some thoughts here. And again, I, I don't want to posture in any kind of way here like I've got some more authority on this subject than I actually do. Um, this is just something I've thought about. It's a, it's a question I think, I, I really think it's important to think critically about things like this. Not just to try to avoid them, but also to like, what do we mean? Like when I was saying like, we should think more about like, what do we mean by bias? I think we throw around bias way too much or in a kind of, maybe not too much. I think bias is a ubiquitous phenomenon. Everyone's got them all the time. If someone says they don't have any biases, I'm like, what? That is not true. Um, there's something that we always have to be on guard against, but the way that we throw it around, the way we use it, um, sometimes in argumentation and debate I think of as um, playing way too fast and loose with that and, rec and not recognizing like how big of a claim it is to say someone's biased. Well similar things when it comes to um, concerns about discrimination stereotypes and things of that nature. Um, I think uh, it's not a disrespect to the moral values involved to put them under the microscope a little bit more to make sure that we're using them properly. So for example I have a huge value on tolerance, and I think it's really important, though, to be careful what we mean by that, and and what does that actually demand of us, um, morally speaking. Similar thing here too about like uh, if there there is a problem with bigotry and stereotypes, but what's the source of the problem? What's the culprit there? What is it that makes it morally problematic? And like I said in the past, I used to think that it was statistical generalizations themselves. When I was uh, out of college and before I went to grad school and I had basically quit heroin cold, cold turkey, and by heroin I mean taking philosophy classes all the time where I could like count on having big philosophical conversations on a daily basis with people who are likewise interested in that. I was like suddenly working a silly job at a bagel shop and I was just starved for these kinds of conversations. So I started making these pins with like provocative sayings on them to try to I like take sandwich orders and like wear this pin. And like sometimes I'd strike up conversations with customers this way. And I had one pin that said empiricism creates racists. And that's basically a phrase to suggest that it's this process of statistical generalization um, and applications, a use of the, these things that uh, is responsible for um, prejudicial attitudes and stereotypes. So I, I thought that in the past. I don't think that anymore. And why? Well, I think there are other things that uh, can be pointed at as the things that are the culprit or the, the thing that's morally problematic about stereotypes and bigotry. Um, and, it, and it's not having to do with the logic of making statistical generalizations. 
and the other, the real kicker though, is that I now have some exposure to seeing how important and integral tracking statistical generalizations on these kinds of issues is useful in promoting social justice. I've had a lot of friends uh, from my college years that I made back then who have gone into nonprofit work in various places and that they, they do tons of work with statistics and analytics to be able to recognize where there is inequality or where there is discrimination happening um, and how to address it. So in really quick, I, and I'm, I'm going to use a toy case here that students gave me before when I, I had this conversation with them. I asked students one time, like, give me a stereotype. And one of my students, she said, Asian women are bad drivers. I like this one. We'll, we'll, we can work with this one. We could have done a bunch of other ones. I think the analysis I'm about to provide you could work just as easily with any stereotype that you want. Um, but let's take that one. Now let's say we do some statistical research, and it turns out, yeah, Asian women, higher probability of being a bad driver. So we've got the sample, the reference class, do the generalization, right? This is how the facts are shaping up. That in itself, I don't think is offensive, involving bigotry, like recognizing that state of affairs. And if I'm going to say that and defend that, I should turn my hat for this whole thing right around. Um, if we were going to say that, we'd have to be able to explain how not, right? And this would be my attempt. I'd say the thing that's problematic about that is, uh, one, how do we explain that pattern? If we were to say, well, the reason why Asian women are bad drivers is because they're Asian and women, that would be offensive. That would, uh, that would, be, uh, that would be problematic. I think um, that that would be the, a basis of bigotry right there. Um, if that's the explanation for it, um, the other thing that could be offensive here could be what we think it justifies. So if we thought based on those statistics, let's take driver's licenses away from Asian women, then that would be a problem too. Um, that, that would, like, a lot of times there could be a statistic that's accurate, but that doesn't necessarily mean a certain response is the right one, right? Like, so people use statistics to justify behaviors or responses to those statistics that I don't think are ethically or morally called for. That's not the right thing. Let's actually go back to the first one really quickly about the explanation thing. I want to tie in this argument about how statistics are so important for working for things like equality and social justice. Um, it might be that instead of us explaining the pattern here that we've discovered through statistical generalizations as being because they're Asian and women, it might be because it's not something about that biologically or genetically or something like that. It's rather that maybe um, Asian women are not being encouraged to drive. Maybe they are, that's like part of them being independent and there are gender roles around this. And so the cultures and communities are not encouraging their women to be independent in this kind of way, so no one's teaching them. So if they're going to do it, they just kind of have to teach themselves. And is that going to make for a better driver or a worse driver? Probably a worse driver, right? But that would, so recognizing the pattern might be an indicator or a piece of evidence that, hey, there's some inequality going on here that needs to be addressed, right? Maybe uh, we need to be caring about equipping them with that skill set. And we wouldn't maybe have recognized that if we hadn't done that research or discovered that pattern. If we're like, oh, that's not a that's not a nice thing to say, to like call attention to that inequality, or people might be worried that it's offensive to say that statistic. But if we didn't if we don't look at it, if we don't recognize that that's the state of affairs and we don't recognize where we have some work to do. That it's for this reason, keep in mind my hat's turned here, that I really don't buy the argument that people sometimes throw around that the more we talk about inequality, the more we're perpetuating it. I don't believe that that's true. There are certain ways of talking about it that definitely don't encourage people to engage with it. Um, some ways that we might be borderline abusive of each other in that regard. But um, I think not talking about it or not recognizing it or just pretending like things are better than they actually are doesn't actually solve a lot of these problems. Um, they have to be addressed more directly. 
and statistical research can help us figure that out. Um, if you've got, um, well, okay, so that's, that's uh, on the first level, the point about how we explain the statistical generalization that we've discovered through our research, right? The second one is about how to respond to it. So it might be like, the response is not to take the driver's licenses away from Asian women, but rather to give them more support in making sure that they have proper training, right? That there's someone that is helping them develop that skill and giving them that kind of support, the way that other people are getting that kind of support. The third thing that I can imagine, and I don't think of these things as exhaustive, there's probably some other ones here too, but these are the three that like really jump out to me when I've re been reflecting on this one. The third way in which I think there could be something offensive about um, stereotypes or, or what sort of is the line between stereotypes versus not stereotypes, like tracking um, statistical generalizations around certain types of demographics, is how uh, there's something wrong about re reducing a person to a statistic. Now that's a kind of slogan that I think also needs to be unpacked a little bit, but I think it kind of comes down to this. When I'm, if you're being looked at by somebody else, and the only way that they form beliefs about you is based on generalizations that they have that they're then applying, like statistical applications, to you, instead of looking at the evidence that's right in front of them by you yourself, that seems disrespectful. It's like you're not being listened to, right? Someone's already formed a judgment about it, and the, you might not fit into that statistical pattern. And the fact that they're not willing to look at the evidence that's right in front of their face and like get to know you for who you are is sort of disrespectful. Um, that people are more than just a collection of their statistics. Um, and I, I'm sympathetic with that. I think, uh, I, I do think that it's impossible to not apply generalizations to people as a part of trying to understand them. So for example, if I say, I, I may have said this at the beginning of the quarter, I definitely said to my one-on-one -on -one students, um, we did some get to know you on the first day, and I'm like, well, you should know about me that I'm um, Lutheran, I'm Lutheran Christian and Buddhist. I'm a Lubu, Lutheran Buddhist. And I just said that. And for that to be informative, for you to like learn something about me, like I'm self-reporting, like here's what's going on with me, for that to be informative to you requires you to have some generalized knowledge about, you know, what are Lutherans like or what are Buddhists like, like what do they believe, what do they value, how do they live, you know, how do they look at things. Um, I'm using that as an identifier for getting to know me, but you need to have some generalizations that you're willing to apply in order for that to tell you something about me. Um, it's even true about uh, if we, if I said I'm like, uh, I'm naturally an introvert, but I've grown into an extrovert over my life. Like, you have to have a frame of reference for that, right? Or um, I like anime or something. And it's possible for there to be misconceptions about that. I actually, uh, I had a student in the last year who heard me say that I was a Lutheran Christian, Buddhist. They heard the Christian part. And they're like, oh, I think Tim finds homosexuality unethical. And it took a long part of the quarter before, uh, and they are not, like kind of getting to know me in other ways in the class. It was an ethics class. Um, and then we finally had a conversation many weeks later. And I was like, yeah, I don't think that. <laughs> I don't think that homosexuality is a sin or that it's immoral or something like that. But it was because he had some generalizations about what, Christians generally believe that then he applied to me. And I didn't fault him for that. I'm like, yeah, I can see why that there could have been a mistaken impression about that based on a generalization from what other people are saying. Um, but that isn't the case for me. But if he was like, I don't believe you, Tim, because statistics say, then I'd be like, okay, what's going on here? Right? That's kind of disrespectful. And be like, I'm just telling you, right? This is this is what is up with me. I don't fit into that statistic. Um, and look at the rest of who I am and how, what are my other ethical beliefs? Like, what would you expect me to think about this issue based on this stuff? So um, to not be willing to change our judgments of a person in those cases where they don't fit into that pattern, that would be problematic too. And I think that's what it mostly comes down to. Every time we're trying to understand each other, 
we have to apply these generalizations, but we can change them, right? They can be, we have to recognize how fallible these forms of inductive reasoning are and be prepared to look past that. Um, and maybe it also means something like when you're meeting a person, like you might have some generalizations on deck, right, that you're going to apply to get a sense of being like, well, if I didn't have any other information, I'd assume this. Um, but maybe quarantine them a little bit and wait to see like what happens and be open to the possibility, you know, explicitly that this, with yourself sort of internally, um, that this person may not fit into that statistic. That would be a educated guess at best, right? Um, so, those are, so those are some of my thoughts about this. Um, that I, I do think that uh, statistical generalizations and applications are kind of unavoidable. Um, and they're, I mean, to cut them out, to say we can't use them at all, seems to be just really um, pulling the legs out from resources that we really need to be able to use, especially if, we con if we're concerned about some of these issues of justice um, and how we treat each other. If we think bigotry um, and stereotypes are a bad thing. So, like I said, most stereotypes are just bad statistical generalizations, too. They have really small sample sizes. They have tons of bias and interpretation going on because there's prejudice involved, uh, like prior formed expectations that don't allow the evidence right in front of you to speak to your conclusion. And they're, they're, usually, they're usually poorly investigated. There's a lot of bias in investigation. Um, there's a sample bias, like you look at like what's on the news rather than how many people you've actually met, you know, that are in that demographic, something like that, you know. So a lot of stereotypes are just bad statistical generalizations. But even the good statistical generalizations, the one that are the ones that are well researched and rigorously performed, there's there there's still ways in which we could engage with those generalizations that are morally problematic. But I've been arguing that it comes down to how we explain them how we employ them, what we think they justify, and this concern about treating people like statistics. Um, if this is interesting to you, if you disagree with me, if you think I'm totally wrong about this, um, I would love to talk about it more. I, I, this is a really cool topic. Um, I think it's important to think about too, and so I'd be, I'd be happy to hear your thoughts about it. Um, and to discuss it some more, but I, I won't do that more in the lecture. Uh, but there's a little little short version of that that little tangent. Um, okay, uh, I will see you soon, um, either tonight with another video or tomorrow, and then again on Saturday. So good luck with everything as we're uh, gearing up here for the end of the quarter. As always, be in conversation with me. I've been encouraged this week. I've had a lot more students calling me up and, and having some conversations and we've been able to sort out uh, in preparation for exam one some like big things that would have gone would have blown up in their faces so if the, the, some of you who have not talked to me um, it's really worth your time I think um, I think there's uh, there's a lot of uh, I'm, a, I'm a useful resource I'm not trying to toot my own horn but um, I'm here for you and I'm gonna offer you what I can and I, and I think it'll be helpful I think it's worth at least taking the shot um, but uh, yeah, don't be shy. Okay, see y'all till next time.